So it's a, a pleasure to introduce our um, first speaker, which is Dr. Tietje uh, from uh, France, and he will give us the 30-day outcomes of the new self-expandable transcatheter hot valve. And uh, Tietje, the floor is yours. So thank you very much, Axel and Eric. So uh, it's my real pleasure to uh, present you the 30-day uh, outcomes of the Centera. Uh, trial and um, this is my disclosure being uh, a consultant for Edwards Life Science. So Centera is a really innovative and uh, unique uh, valve that uh, contains, uh, that is uh, built from a self-expanding nitinol sand frame with a specific uh, contour geometry uh, frame. There is a bulge, a waist, then a flare, and it houses a truly flat bovine pericardial uh, valve, and it has an inner PTFE skirt just to mitigate PV leak. As you can notice, it is of short height, three sizes available, 23, 26, 29. The valve is uh, coupled to an extremely innovative uh, delivery catheter in the sense that the valve is pre-attached. The delivery catheter is uh, a neutral or profile 14 for each inch if compatible for all three valve sizes. It is flexible, it has a, an active uh, flex uh, mechanism, as a, and as you can notice, there is a battery-powered motorized handle which is totally new and act, adds to the stability of the deployment. Two ergonomic buttons, a blue one to load the valve, a green one to deploy it. Very simple, intuitive, and extremely innovative. So as you can see uh, on that animation, simplicity is one of the key uh, features of the Centera because you can see that the packaging is small, the valve is pre attached, easy to flush, easy to prepare. It only, takes, it only takes a couple of minutes to prepare it. So definitely this is something new as compared to what we have now in our cat lab. So simplification of the procedure, simplification of the preparation. So let's now uh, talk more into details about the registry. Uh, so as any uh, robust registry, there was a, a steering committee, CEC committee, a collab, both for the ECO and the CT scans. And Centera uh, recruited 203 patients ac across 23 centers from March 2015 to July 2016. And patients had to be symptomatic with a severe aortic stenosis, had to be at high risk, and uh, they were uh, followed for 30 days, uh, one, uh, 30 days, six months, one year, and then they're going to be followed for uh, on a yearly basis for five years. Primary endpoint, all cause mortality at 30 days. Secondary endpoint, all endpoints, cardiovascular mortality at 30 days, six months, and one year. Stroke and disabling stroke, new onset atrial fibrillation, new conduction abnormalities. So a very robust registry, and we have to thank all the participating centers, 23 centers across Europe, Australia, New Zealand, and they did a tremendous job in recruiting in such a short period of time all these patients. So let's now move into details about the baseline characteristics of the uh, study uh, population. So as expected, the patients were elderly, elderly ones with a mean age of 83 uh, years. They were at high risk with a mean logistic career score of 17%, mean STS score 6.1. They were highly symptomatic, with a vast majority of the patients being in AOH, NMYHA class 3 or 4. And quite noticeable is the permanent pacemaker rate at baseline. In fact, one patient had the duplication of this uh, uh, feature in the baseline uh, database. So in fact, the permanent pacemaker rate at baseline was 7.4. Noticeable is the uh, uh, preserved daily function in the overall population. Procedural-wise, the vast majority of the devices that were used were 26 millimeter ones in 60% uh, of the cases. May, almost all the patients were performed on the conscious, conscious sedation, so a contemporary approach for a transfemoral TAVI uh, cohort and a short procedural time with a skin-to-skin -skin, uh, procedural time of 67 minutes. Uh, so as I said, the valve is pre-attached and it's repositionable up to 85% of its deployment. And although available, that feature was only used in 3.5% of the population. And that really expresses the stability of the device during deployment. Very few need for reposition. As it is a self-expanding uh, valve, uh, post dilatation was required in 33%, uh, one-third of the uh, population. And at the end, technical success was high, device success was high also. So excellent uh, outcomes procedural-wise. 
Now, uh, let's go to the primary endpoint. The primary endpoint was all-cause mortality at 30 days, and it's extremely impressive. 1% all-cause mortality at 30 days. It's extremely, extremely good, a good outcome for our patient, and we are uh, quite proud of that. And when you see the observed over expected ratio, it's only 0.16. 1% cardiovascular all-cause mortality. All the cases of mortality were cardiovascular ones. One patient died from vascular complication before VIVE deployment. The, another one died from cardiac tamponade before VIVE insertion. So cardiovascular deaths, and only we, uh, when we only look at that item, it's only 1%. Disabling stroke, 2.5%, small and uh, low stroke rate. New permanent pacemaker is one of the key findings, uh, apart from uh, low mortality, key findings of this uh, study, 4.9 uh, pacemaker uh, requirement at 30 days. This is, to my knowledge, one of the lowest pacemaker rate for a self-expanding device. So the patients, as expected, were extremely uh, improved at 30 days, with a low, the vast majority of the patients being in NYHA class one or two, and a clear and significant improvement in the six-minute walk test. So functional improvement of the patient. Quite impressive was the uh, hemodynamics of that uh, device at 30 days. If you remember, the vast majority of the devices implanted were 26 ones, not 20, uh, 29. And uh, even though it was only 26 devices that were uh, mainly used, the EOA was 1.9 square centimeter. And when you look at the mean gradient, seven millimeters of mercury, large EOAs, low gradients, and we can expect even better hemodynamics with the 29 millimeter device. Aortic regurgitation, this is one of the uh, inconvenient, one of the pitfalls of self-expanding devices. No cases, no case of severe aortic regurgitation was observed in that cohort. 0.6 uh, moderate aortic regurgitation and 99.4% of the patient had no trace or mild uh, regurgitation. So once again, an excellent outcome. So uh, let me uh, conclude to just uh, remain on time. What we can say is that the Centera is really, uh, really a unique and extremely innovative valve in the sense that the, de the design of the self-expanding stand frame is unique. It is short, this contoured stand frame, and the delivery capture is also unique. It has shown in the Centera a trial to be safe and effective at 30 days, as expressed by a low incidence of all-cause mortality, 1%, low requirement for permanent pacemaker, uh, 4.9, Significant hemodynamic improvements, extremely low rates of moderate or severe peripheral low regurgitation, and a clear improvement of the functional status of the patients. So, so the, the last slide was uh, just to uh, express the stability, the stability of the centera, because we could see that repositioning was needed in only 3.5% of the patient, and that we have seen in our practice, extremely stable, extremely good outcomes, and uh, extremely uh, low pacemaker rate for the patient. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for um, for sharing this excellent results with us. And I think, um, yeah, the results just speak for itself, especially the, the low pacemaker rate. So I uh, kindly asked uh, Dr. Um, Albagani to, to discuss the study. Uh, first of all, uh, congratulations for the impressive uh, results. And uh, I have a single question. It's uh, a twofold question, in fact. So if the reposition recapture is at that low level, like 1%, uh, how you compare this to a uh, post dilation rate of 33%? Don't you believe that recapture is something that we can use more liberally to reduce the rate of post dilation, or it's not that effective, or it's not uh, the, the clue to uh, mitigate uh, leakage? And on the other hand, if we are not using this capability of the device, how do you compare this new device to the workhorse Sapien 3? What advantage uh, does it add? So thank you very much for these uh, two questions, in fact. The first one relates to the uh, low need for repositioning, comparing uh, it to the higher need for post-dilatation. In fact, uh, pre-dilatation was one of the uh, prerequisites for the trial, but what we saw in the vast majority of the center 
that w uh, was that the size of the balloon that was used was small. It wasn't a very aggressive uh, predilatation. So one can expect that with an aggressive predilatation, the rate of post-dilatation would have been lower. But even with the 33% of post-dilatation, we have to keep in mind that the moderate or severe rate of paravalvular regurgitation was extremely low in that trial. So maybe it was wise to do the post-dilatation. And repositioning is... Uh, a quite interesting feature, maybe in some anatomies, like for example, uh, horizontal aortas, but thanks to the stability of the device, it wasn't necessary. The motorized uh, feature of the, the center is really uh, impressive. Your second question relates to uh, the way uh, we're going to position uh, the center uh, uh, as, as regard to the uh, S3. I'm not from Edwards, so the company will answer that. But as a physician, what I can say is that I don't see any real reason not to use Centera for the vast majority of the cases, because it's safe, it's stable, low profile, and the outcomes are great. Low mortality, low stroke rate, and uh, no uh, PV leak, and extremely low pacemaker rate. So I, I, what I uh, imagine is that the centers are going to remain as free centers for those who were as free centers, but some are going to adopt the Centera because it adds to the safety of the procedure for our patients. Thank you. Maybe one last comment from my side. I think what, what you just said on the rate of post-dilatation is, is very important. I mean, uh, we had good results already after the valve had been implanted, but we just want to make it perfect. And uh, uh, I think the level of AR just decreased after the post-dilatation, and what we are seeing here in the study uh, with the slow rates is just you know outstanding. On the other hand, despite of the fact there's always a lot of discussion how post-dilatation, pre-dilatation is affecting pacemaker rates. And in this study, you can see that even with this high rate of post-dilatation, pacemaker rate is low. And I would like to know your perspective on why do you think the rate is that low? What is, what is the strength of this I, valve? Yeah, this is, uh, to be honest, when I saw the results of the Centera, I was really impressed by this low pacemaker rate for a self-expanding device. And I think that it uh, relates to two major things. The first one is the design of the valve, because it's really meant to, with this contoured frame, to remain just around the annulus. And second, uh, the second most important feature is the stability. You don't deploy it very low, you just remain in contact with the annulus. There is minimal interaction with the conjunction system. And these two factors, even though the post-dilatation rate was 33%, uh, generate a really low rate of pacemaker. So the stand frame geometry and then the way it deploys with the stability thanks to the motorized fashion. Great. Thank you, uh, Didier.